What I want to talk about today is um, the re-engineering of a trading system that we recently undertook um, for one of the, uh, in the London offices of one of the larger um, US-based fund managers. Um, now, they, they sort of prefer to remain anonymous, so I guess I can respect that, so I won't say who they are, because, um, you know, I've got integrity, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and they've got lawyers, so... Um, <laughs> yeah, so we'll just leave it at that. Um, so just a quick overview. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, how we came across D, um, you know, how we came to consider it as one of the languages that we would use. Uh, a little bit of an overview of the, the business that we're in and more or less what, how the business actually drives what we need the software to do. Um, from then, I guess I'll talk a little bit about the software, the explicit software requirements that come from these, uh, these business requirements and then how we found that D actually addresses these requirements. So the, um, the re-architecture of the system actually uses a concept called um, event sourcing, which I've used over the past 10 years with varying degrees of success. Um, and this time, uh, I sort of decided to go in for it uh, big time. So I'll give a description of event sourcing and how, how D helps with that, uh, that concept. And uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the um, the architecture that we devised for the new system. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the de-adoption history, um, part of my remit um, within the fund manager is actually to keep an eye out for tools and techniques, libraries, uh, also languages that are going to make our job easier. So I think um, I think it was maybe about three years ago, um, I was in a bookshop in London and I came across, I was looking through the computer languages section and then I found um, the usual suspects were there, C, C++. And um, then I saw D and then I, I face palmed a little and went, oh, really, somebody's done a language called D? <laughs> um, so uh, I took it off the shelf and then I saw who the author was and then um, I instantly went into semi-post-traumatic stress disorder because I remember you know, necking a few bottles of aspirin as I made my way through modern C++ design about 10 years previously. Um, so, so that sort of piqued my interest a little. And then I saw that the, uh, I saw that the language was uh, Walter Bright as well, so also that piqued my interest as well. So um, I think at the time I installed D on one of our servers, um, had a little bit of a play around, and um, I think I tried... Um, I tried to do a quick sort implementation because I thought the, the D range based um, syntax would lend itself quite nicely to a quick sort. Um, so I tried one of those, um, it failed miserably, didn't work. Um, so then I thought, ah, well, you know, it's not going to hurt, I'll just try the community, I'll go into IRC and see if anyone can help me. Um, so I, you know, put on my asbestos underpants and then I went onto the, uh, onto the IRC <laughs> channel and then said, um, <laughs> Um, hey, <laughs> I've got some code, it's not working, can anyone help me? And then uh, somebody responded and said, yeah, give me a few minutes, we'll get back to you. And then a few minutes passed and then I thought, um, I thought, yeah, yeah, he's not going to get it back. And then um, before I knew it, uh, somebody said, right, okay, click on this link. And then uh, I clicked on the link and somebody had actually taken the trouble to actually correct my mistakes. You know, my tuple syntax was all over the place. I hadn't imported the right modules, but... Um, it, it just, it, you know, it, it was nice, the fact that somebody had actually taken the time to actually, you know, put in the time to correct an example. So um, that sort of made a, a good impression on me. Um, so at the time we concluded, yeah, it's a nice language, but at the time we didn't really have an immediate use we could put to it, uh, you know, put it to. Um, so it was pretty much left there. Uh, so another year passed and then, um, we decided that for a couple of reasons we really wanted to rebuild the trading system. Uh, the first reason was that, um, I don't know if anyone was uh, listening to Amory's talk yet uh, yesterday, but um, the fact is that uh, computers have changed a lot and to get the best performance out of them we actually, we actually have to sort of change the way that we use memory, change the way that we um, interact, how we use our algorithms, etc., etc. So. The system was at the time was about five years old, so we thought there was a lot of um, we could actually speed it up quite a lot. Um, 
The second main reason was that uh, we really wanted to go for a fully event sourced architecture. So I'll describe, I'll describe what I mean by event sourcing in a, in a little while. So just to give you a, a bit of a business overview. So I work for a trading group um, within a fund management firm. Uh, so basically all the trading that the group does is actually uh, electronic and it's sourced by the software that we write. So that means a lot of accountability. So on the one hand, I'm accountable to my boss. I'm also accountable to the firm and also to the regulatory authorities. Um, so that's quite, that's quite an onerous uh, responsibility because um, one thing, one of the most sort of nerve wracking things you can do is to actually write software that interacts directly with the markets. So um, in terms of what the, what the group needs from the technology, um, a big part of the job is recording market data. So obviously, you know, we have the, we have the financial markets, uh, there's lots of data generated, and a good part of the job is actually just to, to record all that data as it's being produced. Um, a second responsibility is actually the creation and maintenance of the trading frameworks that we use. Um, so these trading frameworks, as I just mentioned, we, we interact on the markets, we actually interact via brokers, but there's a process called direct market access where we actually send trades to a broker and then immediately after the, the trades will be sent on behalf of the broker to the market. So to all intents and purposes, it's really interacting directly with the markets. The brokers will maybe do some, uh, some slight checks on our orders just to make sure we're, we're basically good for it. You know, we're not trying to um, place trades that we, you know, we can't actually afford to settle. Uh, new data sources is um, another thing that we are responsible for. So the world is generating more data day by day. So we're getting, uh, you know, Twitter, news sources, all that sort of stuff. So uh, part of the job is to actually um, incorporate vendor APIs or maybe to go out to the web and actually scrape data sources. Um, the last one is the one that I think is probably the most interesting to me anyway is the, is the creation of the simulation and analysis tools that our uh, traders will use to, um, you know, to go about their jobs, to analyze trading strategies, to decide if they have something that's going to make money. Um, yeah, so that's basically what, uh, what the technology group within the trading firm, that's basically the remit that they, they have. Um, so it's worth stating that this is a pretty, it's a pretty competitive time pressured environment. So it's, um, it can be quite nerve wracking. So it's important to have, it's important to have tools that you really trust and that you, you can rely on. Um, I mean, this is why I'm going gray. Um, I'm actually, I'm actually 24 years old, you know. You <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so from that, um, so from that business requirement that feeds down into the requirements of the software. So what we have is almost, uh, it's almost a perfect storm of requirements we've got. Things have to be correct, testable, they have to be reliable, we have to be able to modify them quickly. Um, the, the tools have to be productive, but then once we've done that, the tools have to, the software that's produced has to be performant. So it's quite a, it's quite a heavy ask for a language and some, you know, some perform, you know, better than others in these uh, various, uh, I don't know what you'd call them, vectors. Uh, but I think D actually scores quite highly on all of them, um, which is quite unusual because you'll get one language, um, say for example, maybe take Python, uh, very productive, but when it comes down to it, uh, if you try and trade with it in real time, it's not that performant. Um, and uh, personal opinion would be uh, C++, very performant, but being productive in it is, is quite tricky. So I think D sits there, you know, sits in quite a sweet spot where you know, all of these uh, requirements are satisfied quite well. So, um, what makes D a good citizen? Uh, so, we have a very fast compiler, which uh, lend itself to very fast uh, development iterations. So that goes back to the, uh, the productivity point previously. Um, unit tests, so that goes back to uh, testability. Uh, the C-like syntax means we were able to pick it up uh, pretty quickly. Um, so that goes back to maybe, um, what was the point again? Uh, the point about productivity, yeah. Uh, POSIX availability. Um, for the requirement that we had, we really needed to be able to memory map files. Uh, that was going to be very important. So if we couldn't do that, then that was going to be a showstopper. Uh, probably wouldn't be here. Uh, Phobos is um, a very uh, 
very useful standard library. I know the plan is to make it much bigger, but even as it is at the moment, it's very, very, very useful for the, the applications that we have. Um, modifiability, I think, um, I think a couple of people have said that, and um, it's difficult to maybe put your finger on exactly why that's the case. Um, I think one of them is that uh, one of them is that there's no separation of the interface and implementation files. So I think uh, traditionally, if I had something running in C++, I'd be a little bit loath to change it because I knew that I would have to, you know, uh, ping pong back between the header file and the implementation file. So just having it um, having it be the one file, I think, lends itself to um, lends itself to uh, modifiability. And um, I think this might get a few laughs, but um, so far there haven't been any nasty language surprises. Um, now, <laughs> I'm not trying hard enough, obviously. <laughs> um, so compare and contrast, we have tried a few other languages, so I'm not going to name them, but there are, there are some languages that have got some complete humdingers of uh, surprises in, in store for a, an unwitting user. Um, they, you know, they completely violate the principle of uh, least surprise in some cases. Um, so back to back to Phobos, what for our specific um, use case has been useful. Um, it's a lot of the time it's 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 not the most complicated stuff, but just things like command command line parsing. Um, it's uh, it's very tedious. I don't know how many times I've uh, I've gone back to uh, boost program options. Every time I use that library, I have to go back to it and learn it again. Whereas getopt, I think I could probably I could probably sketch you know how you use getopt from memory. Um, JSON parsing, uh, JSON seems to be becoming almost like a lingua franca in finance. So if you're able to parse it and generate it, it makes it makes interop with other languages very easy. Um, date time, uh, time of day becomes very important in finance. So uh, thanks, Jonathan Davis. <laughs> um, yeah, when, when C++ 11 came out, I asked, uh, asked a friend, okay, so how do I get um, today as a ISO 8601 string um, in C++ 11? And the answer was still, oh yeah, you have to go back to the, you know, whatever it is, the time module or whatever, um, STRF time, which in this day and age, I still think is a little bit, uh, it, it should be better really. So, so date time's a great module. Um, Atomics and Bitop, they make, um, they make dealing with, um, atomic operations on memory mapped files quite easily. And um, CSV, unfortunately, uh, CSV is endemic in finance. You, you can't get away from it. It's, it's just all over the place. So um, the CSV module, just to be able to, to parse in a CSV file and have it populate an array of structs was, uh, was quite an eye opener, even though that, you know, even have it handle the enumerations and stuff was, uh, was really good. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, event sourcing. So that's the, um, that's the new sort of architectural pattern that we've chosen for the, the new system. Now, I've been using this um, on and off for about 10 years now. Um, I used to call it event-based programming, but it seems to be that the, the cool kids are calling it um, event sourcing now, so I'll just fall in line and call it event sourcing. So the, the concept behind event sourcing is that you, uh, you capture Everything that's going to change the, the state of your system, you capture it as a stream of events that is ordered and persisted. Uh, so for our examples, um, events would be things like uh, orders. So if we, send a, if we send an order to an exchange, um, that would be an event. If we receive an event back from an exchange, that would be an event. Um, other things such as uh, um, user actions. So if somebody clicks a button, if somebody changes a text field, Basically, anything that happens that is going to affect how the system behaves and the outputs it's going to produce, these have to be captured as events or the whole thing just falls apart. Um, another type of event would be heartbeats. So we've got, a, we've got one process that will just uh, inject heartbeats into the system regularly just to keep it uh, ticking over. So um, <laughs> uh, the next thing is... Um, in this event sourced architecture, um, the system is represented as a state function. So the idea is that at any, given, at any given point during the day, you have a state object which represents the state the system's in. Uh, so for a real system, this is, quite a, this is quite a large object which contains data about all the stocks you're trading and what state they're in, how, how many 
shares have traded in those different uh, different uh, uh, securities. So the idea is that to get from, uh, if you're in a given state n, uh, there will be an input event n, and then when you run the state function over those events, you'll get uh, state n plus one, which will be the state after the event has been applied, and then you'll have um, outputs. Well, you potentially will have outputs, zero or one outputs for the um, for the nth step. So I think um, when I looked at this in um, Wikipedia, I think um, I mean we've got some computer scientists in the house. Maybe you can tell me what it is, but I think um, I think this thing is described as a Mealy machine. Yes. Correct. State transducer, and there's a Mealy and a Moore machine that are the implementations. Okay. So uh, what he said basically. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, so if we look at the first uh, the first couple of states that the system goes into, so we have uh, the first three states of the day. So state one depends on the initial state and event zero. Uh, state two depends on state one, event one, and state three the same. So if you take uh, state three and expand it in terms of the th three previous, uh, it, you can see that um, the third state depends on the zero state and basically the three events that have preceded it. So if you expand that, then uh, I hope it's uh, I hope it's self-evident that the at the nth state you're dependent on the initial state and all the events that have uh, proceeded up to that uh, that state. Um, so does does that make sense? Because if that doesn't make sense, then everything that proceeds is going to not really make that much sense. So speak now or hold your peace. Good. Okay. Cool. Um, so basically, what I've said is that the state function is um, is pure. So uh, if we have purity, what does that really mean? Um, you know, what's the big deal? Uh, well, the, purity, the function of purity just basically means that if you feed the same uh, inputs to the system, it will produce the same outputs. So if we're pure, there's all these nice little uh, properties that we get. Uh, the main one is uh, determinism. So if we feed the system the same events, we'll get the same, uh, we'll get the same output every time. So we get repeatable behavior. Uh, so that's um, that's very important for a whole slew of purposes, a uh, whole slew of reasons. Um, one of which is uh, resilience. So if we if we start the system up, uh, if we stop at midday, we can basically start again, just play the events up to that point, and the system will be in the same state it was when we shut it down. Uh, regression testing is very important. So if we if we think we've got a, a super cool optimization that we can apply to the system, uh, basically what happens is we can we can feed the events through the the modified system, and if we get the same outputs, um, then we can be we can be happy that we've uh, you know we've actually not caused any change to the system. Uh, post trade analysis is very important. So if, uh, for example, at the end of the day, if we found out that we we made a lot more on a particular stock, or we made a lot less, which is usually the case on a particular stock, then what we can do is um, we can basically go back through the events that we captured during the day, uh, play them back through the system, and then we can, we can look at how the, how the state of the system was evolving as the, as the day went on. Uh, auditable is a, a very important property as well. So it's, it's not uncommon to get a tap on the shoulder and be asked, why did the system do this at this particular point in time during the day? So the really cool thing is that we can uh, we can just basically dust the events off the off the shelf and then play them back through the system, and then we can we can actually wind the system to the exact moment when it made that particular decision. So that's uh, so to keep uh, to keep keep compliance and uh, managers and uh, regulatory authorities um, happy. That's that's great. That's a huge win. Um, Resilience is also very important, obviously. If we've got a box that goes down, we want to be able to restart on another one. So usually what we have is um, some sort of replicator process that's basically taking the events as they occur and copying them off to a, another box. Uh, the idea being that if the, um, if the box goes down, we can just restart. Um, we can play the, play the events through the standby system and then have the standby take over as the trading system. Um, Actually, I was just discussing with Brad. There's a few uh, there's a few algorithms that do this um, already out in the public domain. Uh, one of which is Paxos, which is quite hard to uh, implement. Um, another consensus algorithm, which is easier to implement, is called Raft. So, um, as in as in life, Raft. So um, they're worth looking at if you're not familiar with them. Uh, parallelizable. This is actually 
this might actually be the most important point. So, um, what's the best way of describing this? Um, so, I'm not a games programmer, but from what I understand of games programming, um, the you basically have every single frame, you've basically got a time budget in which you have a certain number of tasks that you can perform. So you maybe do a little bit of input processing, a little bit of physics, a little bit of something else, and a little bit of drawing polygons. So you're always cognizant that you've got this budget of time that you have to, to spend um, doing what you can do every frame. So um, it's a bit like that in finance. You have um, you have for every every time there's a market data event or you get a trade, you have a certain amount of time that you can um, you can respond to that event. So you spend maybe a little bit of time updating your data structures, a little bit of time making a decision: do you need to trade? Do you need to do anything? And then a little bit of time deciding: okay, I'm going to trade now. Uh, but the the cool thing is um, those tasks they usually fall into one of two categories. So uh, usually they they either involve the act of doing something that's uh, directly responsible for trading, or they are responsible for doing something that's responsible for providing input, uh, providing feedback back to the users of the system. So what what we can do if we have a if we have a system that's parallelizable, we can actually split the system into two parts. So we can dedicate one entire process to the act solely of trading, and then we can have another um, process that is responsible for doing all the stats generation and the reporting and producing pretty pictures and graphs and uh, time series updates and things like that. So that's really good because um, traditionally um, in this type of system you're always sort of you're always aware that you've got this budget of time that you have to play with and you you're always making these decisions about whether or not you decide to actually calculate a certain statistic or do a certain event. But if you have them split out, the great thing is that you can spend this amount of time trading, but for generating the statistics, you can basically, you know, my right hand can stretch to the end of the room because it doesn't really matter all that much. As long as the, as long as you don't go to town too much, as long as the, the system catches up eventually, you can actually have these two, these two parallel systems running, one dedicated to trading and one dedicated to actually updating GUIs and producing, you know, time series and um, uh, metrics and stuff like that. Uh, does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good. So far, so good. Um, so there's a but to what I've just said. Um, so I actually lied a little bit. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the system as I described it, the pure functional version, um, performs very badly in reality because um, if, you're, if you actually do it as I described it, you're actually allocating like a madman. And um, the performance of that is, well, it, it still could be decent for some purposes, but um, you really want the thing to be as fast as it possibly can. So even if you uh, play clever tricks and do persistent data structures, et cetera, et cetera, it's still not actually fast enough to perform. So actually having imperative code with state mutation is actually a lot faster. Um, I, I don't know, does anyone disagree with that? I think that's relatively self-evident, yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, let the record show everyone nodded, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, that state mutation model is what we actually have. So we don't have something that produces state n plus one from state n. It's actually all in place. Um, so yes, I did lie a little bit. However, um, the, the useful properties are still there. So the same input still produces the same output. Um, so we say that mutation is still okay. Um, so what I would compare it with would be the, um, the concept of uh, transients in the closure language. Is anyone familiar with that? Oh, that was a bad choice then. Um, <laughs> well, the, um, the overriding um, philosophy of closure is that it deals with uh, pure functions, immutable state, and um, the idea of a mutable vari variable is anathema in this language. However, as an optimization, uh, when you're making a change to a data structure, they do allow these sort of temporarily mutatable objects. So uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to argue it that strongly, but the, um, really, if, uh, if we have a pure system, then I'd, ar I'd argue that that's an equivalent sort of case. So we have mutable state, but ultimately we do have repeatable pure behavior. So it's maybe not pure in a, a pure um, computer science perspective, but for all the um, for all the purposes where it matters for us, it's, uh, it's good enough. 
So um, I'll talk a little bit about the architecture of the new system. Uh, so basically what we have is uh, at the core of the system there's basically two layers. So at the, at the center is the business logic, which is basically all the, all the logic that pertains to the act of trading. So updating data structures, deciding whether to trade, keeping track of whether you're making money or losing money. Um, that is all that is contained within the business logic. And then on the outer layer, there's, a, there's an event processing uh, layer which deals with things like concurrency, persistence, and um, the ordering in which we dispatch events into the system. Now, I would argue very strongly that um, these two concerns have to be kept as far apart from each other as they possibly can. Um, now, I've seen, uh, I've seen a lot of code in the past that looks something along the lines of acquire a lock, then order manager dot send order, then persister dot persist order. And that, uh, that's an awful way of doing it. Um, persistence and concurrency need to be kept as far away from the business logic as possible. It's um, mixing the two together is just, uh, is just asking for trouble. So uh, I think what I've just described, so we've got the, the inner layer. So it's very simple, uh, very simple callback code. So there's no, there's no concurrency or anything. It's all single threaded. And then it handles stuff like the order logic, stats calculation, um, profit loss calculations. Um, and it's all single threaded. So the good thing is that the, uh, my colleagues, uh, quantitative traders, uh, quantitative analysts, they don't have to deal with the concept of a thread at all, which is, uh, is quite nice because uh, one, they like it because um, they don't have to deal with threads. And two, I like it because they are not dealing with threads, which is, uh, is, a, is a good thing. <laughs> Um, so an interesting, an interesting point is that the, the concept of time is something that you can't, uh, it has to be provided by the framework. So if you think about earlier what I said, if you're playing, if you're playing back a system, you can't actually, you can't actually just go to the wall clock and uh, ask what's the time. So the, uh, the outer layer is actually, it actually has some concept of a chronometer that will provide a time signal to the, um, to the outer layer. So the outer layer, this is, I, I finally mentioned the D language, great. <laughs> so the outer layer is the part that handles um, all the concurrency and persistence and uh, delivery of events to the, uh, the core of the system. So that, the, this outer layer is implemented in terms of uh, streams. So uh, stream conceptually is uh, an append-only uh, sequence of events, basically, um, that can be written to and queried at the same time. So at any given point in time, anyone can come along and append to one of these streams. And if you're a consumer of one of these streams, you can, you can basically say, OK, I want to start listening to the stream. But if you so desire, you can go back to any arbitrary point in the stream's past. So that's what makes all this event source stuff possible. Uh, so inside, also inside the, um, the outer layer is an event loop, which is basically, it's just a glorified thread whose sole purpose in life is to is to loop over streams and decide which event has to be dispatched next to the to the business logic. Um, an important point as well is that as these as these things get um, as these things get fired, the the outer layer actually persists the act of firing the event, so that uh, when we start up next time, the events will fire in the same the same order that they were previously. Um, that makes sense so far. Any questions or no? Okay, still still good. Okay, um, so this is the uh, this is a conceptual diagram of the the live trading system uh, as we have it. Uh, so there are basically three inbound streams um, in order of uh, number of events per day. So the the main one is the um, is the market. So we get round about. Um, 250 million events on this thing uh, every day. Uh, the execution stream is um, is basically the the events that we get back from our brokers. So that's a bit more sedate. So we get uh, something of several hundred thousand uh, events on this guy every day. Um, so the sources of these, the the first stream is sourced from the market. Uh, the second one is from our uh, brokers ultimately. 
Um, the third one, I think I was in a bad mood when I wrote it. I've, uh, I've said that the third source is basically carbon units. So that's uh, people, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Defective carbon units. <laughs> uh, so that's... Um, <laughs> Uh, so that's basically uh, people that are using the system, generating mouse clicks, uh, making events, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, from from one perspective, you can yeah. look at them. <laughs> yeah, you can. Okay. Um, okay, I've lost my thought now. Um, <laughs> okay, so basically, the the main event loop basically decides uh, in the in the live system. He's basically pulling events off these streams as quickly as he can and he's uh, persisting the order that they were uh, persisted in. Now, if uh, at any given point during the course of firing an event, we decide that we want to trade, then there's, a, there's also an outbound uh, stream on which uh, the order will get placed. And then that will get picked up by a process that will, will, then, send the, um, will then send that order onto the broker. Uh, so this, um, this cons at the bottom is, uh, is what we've called the consensus queue. So this is the one that we uh, consensus queue stroke stream. So this is the one that persists the um, the ordering that we've actually fired events in. Uh, I better gloss over it, but basically this guy ensures that uh, when we start up again, we fire the events in the same order that they were received. Uh, simulation is um, is another type of event loop, but that, that sources its data entirely from a, a historic market data stream, um, and we use this uh, we have a simulator which uh, pretends to send us um, uh, fills back when we send pretend orders. Now these, um, these two uh, circular structures here, they're not actually streams, they're just, um, uh, just in-memory ring buffers that are used as a, a delay line effectively. So we use these things to model, to model the, light, the latency between ourselves and our brokers. So, um, Question I'm sure you're asking, I've been wittering on for half an hour and I haven't actually mentioned D yet. So the question on everyone's lips, where is D used? <laughs> so basically the pieces in, oh, sorry. Uh, the pieces in red are basically all D. So the, the idea is that we have uh, various APIs that are provided to us and they need to have C linkage to get the, the best use out of them. So what happens is in the market data case, we have a a D process that connects to a C API, uh, pulls data from the API, and then uh, applies uh, events to the, the market data stream. Now, the, the, central, uh, the central event loop is actually a Java Scala process. Mr. Bright. Uh, we're working on turning the carbon units into D as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the one piece I couldn't get into D, yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so, uh, lost my train of thought now. Okay, Car carbon <laughs> units, uh, okay. So, yeah, okay. So, uh, why, why there and not, why didn't we replace the carbon units as well? Um, so, there's a requirement to use these streams, we need two things. We need to have uh, C linkage and we need to have uh, the ability to memory map files. So. The previous system used uh, JNI. Uh, I think it was uh, vendor-provided JNI libraries we used. But we wanted to get this thing as fast as we possibly could. So really, the, um, the, the JNI bindings are really just a bit of an afterthought that have been cobbled onto the, um, cobbled onto the C API. So if you, want to, if you want to use it optimally, you really have to go for the, um, the, C, the C route. Uh, so that was one of the things that I remembered was that uh, D had C linkage, so we could use that. Um, we could actually use D to to interact with these APIs, and instead of having to use C, we could use a nice, uh, you know, a nice expressive language like uh, like D. So what we found was that uh, D with C linkage and being able to memory map, we uh, it actually killed two birds with one stone. So we could um, uh, we could actually uh, take data from the API and put it into these uh, into these streams. Now. The original intention, as I stated it, was that we would, uh, we would use D only as a prototype language. We would just use it to, to get something up and running quickly. And then once we had it up and running, we would do it in a real language such as C or C++. <laughs> um, but um, when it was up and running, I was, um, I was happy enough with it and the team was happy enough with it that uh, we just decided to stick with it. We had, we had enough things in our issue tracker. There were around about 800 other things 
most of which I would consider to be more important than going back and rewriting this thing in uh, C or C++. So uh, that's what we did. We just stuck with the D version, and uh, it's performing fine. Um, so I'll... Uh, question? <laughs> okay. So I'll uh, talk a little bit about the stream abstraction. Um, there, are, there were basically two candidates for how we would represent these streams. Um, so I'll give a little bit of credit to um, two guys in the Java space that have sort of, uh, they've done a really good job of uh, popularizing these concepts. So we've got Martin Thompson and uh, my ex-colleague Pete Laurie. Um, so I would say that this work uh, borrows heavily from the work that they've done, but in truth that's that's a bit dishonest because the reality is this is just straight theft of their work. <laughs> um, it's really just a, um, largely the concepts are basically theirs and this is just a, a transliteration of uh, the work they've done into, into D. So two options for a stream. Uh, the first option is just basically to just memory map a section of file and rip through it contiguously and event and place events uh, in order into the stream. Um, and then once you've populated an event, you would maybe, uh, you would populate some member of the struct to inform the, the reader that the, that event was indeed available for consumption. Um, so that's got a couple of advantages. It's very, it's very simple. It's just a straight M map call. Um, in Java land, it's a little bit more complicated because you can only map um, an integer chunk at a time, but we won't concern ourselves with that because this is a detalk. Um, so it's, this structure is quite, uh, quite friendly to a lot of another, a lot of other analysis tools like, uh, like NumPy, for example. So if you've got one of these contiguous structures, you can just memory map it and start graphing and analyzing. Um, the downside is it's not too, um, it's not too friendly on the memory subsystem. So you get, uh, you get page faults as you, you know, as you stream along, you, you'll go off the end of a page and then the page will have to be, you know, paged in from the, the memory system. So it's not great in that respect because it can cause delays. Um, the other one is that it's, uh, it's bounded. So um, you can, if you underestimate the amount of uh, events you're going to have, which I did a few times, they the can actually run out. So it's not great in that respect. Um, a better option is to use um, a circular array, which is uh, a little bit less simple, but it tends to be more cache friendly. And um, another one disadvantage is that uh, obviously you loop around the ring buffer, you lose all the events that you've had previously. So you have to have some sort of uh, journal off to the side of the events that you've, uh, you've retired. So what that looks like um, in practice is um, the stream has, the, the current one, the, the latest fancy one, has uh, multiple readers and multiple writers. So the idea is that everyone is sort of going clockwise around this, uh, this buffer. Uh, writers append to the tail of the queue, which is maybe a little bit counterintuitive, and uh, the readers actually read from the head. Uh, so in, in a memory map, that looks, like, um, that looks like this. So you basically have... Uh, you basically have a small header which describes the various uh, heads and tails that you've got in the in the structure, and then you've got a, a data segment which is basically where all the, the data is stored. Uh, so for the multiple reader, um, one thing that was uh, sorry for the multiple writer case, one thing that was uh, necessary was the was to have a locked XAD ASM instruction implemented. Uh, now that that only recently made its way into um, Java seven as the increment and get. Um, function in the unsafe library. Now, as, as I wrote this, we didn't have the, the complete atomic thing in Phobos. It might have been, it might have been pulled and it might be there um, now. But at the time, um, it wasn't in. And, and I thought that was, that, was a good, um, that was a good example. I mean, if you're, a, if you're a C guy, then you go, well, it's just inline ASM, what's the big deal? But um, if you're stuck in Java land, the ability to, the ability to actually handcraft your own um, assembly if the language doesn't support it natively is actually is actually quite a big deal. Um, so I think this is a this is a steal from uh, Martin Novak. So I was I was hoping to thank him for for doing it, but obviously he's not here. So if he's I don't know if he's online, but uh, thank you, Martin. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the uh, I'll maybe uh, just gloss over a few slides. I'm a bit cognizant. I'm running out of time. So we have uh, this is basically the the code for the uh, the writer. So the idea is that uh, when you want to write a slot, there's a, basically two, there's two uh, processes involved. So you basically have to reserve a slot 
uh, then you'll get back a, a T star, where T is the, the payload of the, of the ring buffer. And then once you're, uh, once you're satisfied that uh, you've stopped playing with the data, then you call commit. And then when, when that happens, the, uh, the, the algorithm casses the, uh, the new tail value that you're, um, you're applying into the, into the buffer, uh, into, the, into the header of the, the section. Uh, multiple heads is um, uh, basically when you're when you decide where the the last head is basically the slowest consumer uh, you you basically need to get the minimum of all the heads that you've got in the um, in the data structure now the only reason I've put this in here is I was quite pleased with myself because this is actually a template meta program so I'm going oh yes this is great um, I can finally do template meta programming <laughs> <laughs> um, now um, Amory mentioned yesterday that in Java land, uh, one thing that you have to do is to actually pad your structures to avoid uh, false sharing. So this was, a, this was my stab at avoiding it in D. So uh, there's a, a template called a padded, which is parameterized on the type that you want to stick into the shared memory section. So basically all this does is take, uh, is take a primitive and just pads um, enough structure around the side of it uh, in order to avoid false sharing. Um, so Amory mentioned yesterday there is a there is a Java equivalent, but it's um, it's not quite as nice. Uh, all okay so far? Questions or okay? Why is it one twenty eight? Excellent question. Um, <laughs> right. Okay. So I guess the question is uh, why am I using one twenty eight and not sixty four, which is the cache line size? Um, that I got a wrap over the knuckles from Martin Thompson recently. Um, it turns out that the, the prefetcher actually does things in units of 128, and um, I measured it, and it does, make a, it does make a noticeable difference. So even though it's not full sharing in the traditional sense, um, the, the prefetcher actually does thing in, things in 128 uh, byte chunks. So um, uh, that's, uh, 128 is a number that uh, a few people that are doing this sort of thing have started to use as well. So. I've sort of cargo culted it, but I, I did um, I did measure it and it did seem to be a little bit faster. It wasn't a, it wasn't an in depth test, but um, it seemed to be a bit faster. Why is the preamble not just like the value and the packet? Uh, I think that was largely um, copying the um, the previous structure uh, that was in Java, but I guess you don't know for sure exactly where the thing is going to start. So if you I think if you, uh, is there a pathological worst case where if you put two of these things together, they could still be in a, uh, in a cache line? Yeah, um, I think largely, the best answer I can give is I just copied it from the Java version. <laughs> but I think there, um, I think there is a, there might be a pathological worst case where if you don't, if you don't pad at the start, you could still get, uh, you could still get false sharing. Um, so I'll just whip through the, the last pieces. So um, the queues that I've shown you, um, basically that translates to two processes in D. So we have a, we have a market data consumer, uh, which looks pretty uh, simple. Um, so we have an API, uh, which provides us with callbacks that hits D. And then in the D code, we populate into a, a slot in the market data stream. So struct-wise, the, the thing that we're populating looks a little bit like this. This is this is maybe an example. It's not it's not real production code, but these things they look a little bit like this. So you'll have some sort of uh, integer at the start of the message, saying what the what message type you're actually dealing with, and then the security ID will uh, basically say will be an integer uh, describing which uh, security you're looking at. So you'll have different values for you know Apple or Cisco or whatever. Um, so. Um, the main point there is that it's not really it's not really that it's a struct it's more to get a certain alignment in the the buffer because ultimately it's um it's a java process that's consuming this thing so reading structures in java unfortunately this is the so these are the sort of hoops that you have to jump through to or in order to read a struct in java so there's an unsafe module that lets you uh basically crack open the hood and inspect native memory so you have to do something like this to um to consume that struct that I just showed you on the previous one. Question? Isn't Java big endian? Uh, no. Uh, well, no, sorry, for the, the unsafe module actually um, pulls uh, things out in little endian. Right, and then it translates it into big endian for the other code, or? 
Uh, no, no, it's all it's all little endian. It just works out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the unsafe module anyway. But the the data output stream classes in Java, you're right, they're big endian. So you have to write your little endian equivalents. And just um, don't don't forget to repeat questions or guys uh, come to the microphone. Okay, sorry. So the the question was. Um, uh, isn't uh, isn't Java big endian? But uh, for this for this particular class, it behaves. It, you get little endian um, ordering. Thanks. <laughs> um, so I'll plow on. I've only got five minutes left. But um, the the idea is that this is something that you don't want to write. Well, maybe the first time you write it, you think you're being uh, no. Actually, it's, it's not even fun the first time you write it. Actually. <laughs> um, so um, so. One of the facilities that D has, the compile time uh, introspection. Uh, so basically, I've written a little thing that will, uh, for the bid ask change um, struct that I showed you earlier, it will actually introspect into the um, introspect into the struct and show the names and the types and the offsets of the, the various uh, members of the struct. So when I run that thing, I get something that looks a little bit like that, like this. Um, so I don't have the um, I don't have the code from the project here, but um, Take it on good faith, that is enough to actually do a bit of string manipulation and actually generate um, the entire Java class that I just showed you. So that was, that's, been, that's been great because at the, at the 11th hour it turned out that uh, a few other event types showed up that we didn't have uh, mappings for. So to be able to feed these things through and have the code gen you know, automatically generate the struct and not have you know, human error carbon units involved with the process um, was very useful. Uh, so that's the, the first process using D. The second one is um, the electronic trading part. So basically the part that takes uh, orders and sends them off to our brokers and receives messages back from the broker. So conceptually it looks a little bit like this. So the, the D gateway uh, consumes events from the outbound queue and then from there it generates a, a string which it then uses to call into the API, into the trading API. So what will happen is that the, the API will receive that string, send it off somewhere, the, the market will respond and send an event back, and then the API will then call us back. Um, and then on another thread, uh, we'll receive a string which will then get parsed into uh, a data structure on the, the inbound stream. So the good thing is that the, um, on the trading side, we don't have to deal with any of the nastiness of the, the string API that we're using. and the the structures that we have on our streams are actually nice and easily consumable by the um, uh, by the by the trading system. So, trading API. Uh, so it's relatively straightforward. It does two things. So it turns um, outbound structs to strings, and then turns inbound strings to structs. Um, and then we've got uh, one thread dedicated to each, and uh, there's. Uh, no sharing of anything between those two threads, so there's no contention. Everything can just uh, everything can just proceed at full speed. Um, the protocol that we use, the protocol that we have to generate the strings in, is uh, is Fix, which is a truly awful protocol that has been sort of uh, mandated to the financial industry. Um, uh, I won't go on to in too much detail about it, but um, suffice to say that. Uh, in order to deal with this protocol, um, we had to drop down to old school C style string processing, uh, which uh, D was more than capable of. Um, so I think I, I'm at 48 minutes, I think, so I better, uh, better wrap up. So in conclusion, um, yeah, D, a very useful addition to the toolbox. Um, uh, it was definitely worth it to go ahead with an adoption. And I think the project was completed much faster than we could have done if we'd gone for the safe option and just, uh, you know, just stuck with uh, C or C++. And um, my feeling is um, uh, D's definitely got a niche in finance that uh, I think uh, is just ripe to be exploited. Uh, so I think that's me pretty much done, actually. I'm just in at 49 minutes. Um, yeah, I'm done. Uh, questions? We have uh, four minutes for questions. Uh, please come to the microphone, thank you. Okay, so this is real-time trading. What sort of um, latency do you need in terms of reaction time between an event coming in and a reaction going out? Right. And how, um, how do your mem mem what memory management strategies do you need to use to get that? Uh, well, the, as it turns out, the, to, the, to the extent that we've measured it, the, the whole thing can uh, respond in less than a microsecond. <coughs> so it's just using, 
just using sort of modern uh, memory management, uh, you know, principles. Um, we, as it turns out, um, back to the, we have, uh, we have this guy. So basically, we use this uh, this simulator. Um, we can use this tool to basically uh, mirror how we would perform. Had, did we have certain latencies? And as it turns out, it doesn't it doesn't need to be um, it doesn't need to be that fast. We don't need to be the fastest people in the industry. But there's definitely um, there's definitely a barrier to entry. I mean, if we'd if we'd rocked up with Python trying to trying to do the same thing, we would have been yeah, I would I would be in a cardboard box by this stage. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Does that answer your question, yeah? Um, oh, uh, go, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned you had to do C-style string processing. I'm just wondering why. Uh, because uh, when, we, when we send something, so the trading system generates a struct. Uh, now, we have to basically send one of these strings to the, um, to the broker. So that's where we drop down into, into C-style string processing. So we basically have a routine that goes over the struct and actually you know, is doing uh, you know, STR cat to the, to the end of the string. The, one of the bigger problems is that, um, yeah, one of the nasty things about that protocol is that um, if you have, um, it's because it's text-based, if you send maybe 10 shares or 1,000 shares, you have to basically shuggle the whole string along, if that makes sense. So, Really, what uh, what we've ended up doing is just regenerating the whole string every time we have to send something outbound. So we're basically, we're recycling one buffer. Um, so every time a message comes in, we basically rewrite that buffer and then give the, a pointer to that buffer to the API. That makes sense to me, but it seems to me that indeed there would be better ways to reuse the buffer than C style stuff. Uh, there probably would be. I mean, bear in mind this was uh, this was relatively new BD stuff. So uh, you know, for comfort, I uh, sort of uh, ran to the familiar and just went for the fair enough C stuff. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, I knew Andy was going to come. I was very excited to uh, hear this talk. Um, <laughs> this one, I, I haven't met him, and you know, kind of failed to get into this tier. So I was actually looking for the nice shoes. Thinking that you know he's a hedge fund guy and you know he's, but apparently he's wearing sneakers. So, <laughs> so am I. So, he's just like us. So this was a great combination of um, science and math. And you know I love a slide with a bit of latte on it and kind of mathy stuff. Cool. So um, very many thanks to Andy. Thank you. <laughs>